Amen. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you so much. That's a good start to this evening. Lovely to see you here. Uh, a couple of notices before we start the Bible study. Uh, the first one, this is the last Bible study of 2022. Ah, but we'll be back on the 11th of January in 2023. The Lord willing, the Lord tarries and all the rest of it. Um, so look forward to uh, starting uh, again and concluding the Beatitudes next year. Um, you know, some days you can have a, you can be shocked, can't you? Are you easily shocked? Anyone here easily shocked? Well, I was, um, uh, before coming here, I thought, oh, I better cook tonight's dinner before I come here so it's ready for when I come back. And I opened the, the, the spice cupboard and there immediately was a cockroach. It was horrible. Ah, no. And I went, Helen, Helen, cockroach, cockroach, ah. And uh, Helen always takes care of spiders, cockroaches, you know, moscas. She, she's the girl. So she, I said, oh, watch, I shut the door. And she got, she got the spray. She said, well, open it, open it. I open it. Sh -sh 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 shut the door. Oh, dear. And then it fell out. And then it was on the floor. And then we couldn't find the spray. And oh, I'm such a wimp, really. I left it all to Helena. She picked it up and put it away. And then, as if that's not enough, I've done choir rehearsal this evening. Oh, it was great fun. It was really good fun. There's one particular song where the men are doing something slightly different. And um, anyway, I'm a little bit playful at times when I'm not Marcia shaking the head. I'm a little bit playful at times. And I was very naughty leading the men astray during the choir rehearsal. And that evoked me being told off. So, Marcia, I do apologize publicly, and um, I'll do the same on the night. I won't be able to stop myself. I, I, I'm not going to be able to stop myself, um, because when I'm not in the formal position, it's good to play, isn't it? It's nice to have some fun, is it not? Yeah? Well, we'll see how it goes, because, final notice, next Wednesday is the carol service here at four o'clock, and that's so that people can finish and get back in, in more of the light. So be here, be here for the carol service and make sure you bring a friend. And I've just had one last, I've just had one last notice. Salt Sisters Yay! is on Saturday. What time? at 11 o'clock this Saturday, Salt Sisters, a very special Christmas special. And do look at the Salt Church um, Facebook website because some of the ladies uh, did a little ditty which was posted yesterday, and it's quite good fun to watch, so end of notices. Well, God bless you. It's fantastic to have everybody here tonight. And to all those who are going to watch this um, online, those who have gone away because it's a, a busy season. And a lot of people have said that they will catch up and watch it. So uh, uh, good, to, good to have you watching whenever it is that you're watching it. And uh, we're coming to, um, number. we're on number six actually, but it's number five. It's the fifth beatitude that we are on this evening. And uh, we've got it up, up on our screen. And, and again, just Welcome to everybody. We're just past the halfway mark. Uh, we're looking at the Beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And we're continuing to progress uh, through the Christian charter of what it is to be a Christian, what it is uh, inward, and now we're starting to think much more about our behavior and all the inward goodness that God has given us, how it shows through us. And um, the charter that Jesus gave us, these eight short sentences, they're, they're easy to remember. And if we constantly re remember them and what they mean, they will help us in our Christian walk. Uh, but it's a much better charter from Jesus than trying to keep the Ten Commandments or the 631 or two, however many they are, that the old covenant prophet Moses gave us because we can't keep it. Um, and so it's much better uh, that with faith in Jesus, we can go an awful long way to keeping these ones. We can go an awful long way to have the character uh, of Jesus and to have the Holy Spirit working through us and putting these um, characteristics into um, into practice. So tonight we're looking at an outward one, uh, what it means to be merciful, and then the corresponding blessed blessing uh, uh, that goes with that. And so to help us understand a bit further, we could look at the Beatitudes, uh, particularly the, these ones, we could look at them as being roots, shoots, and fruit. 
And uh, the three uh, first Beatitudes uh, deal with our need. We are poor in spirit because we don't have what it takes to live God's commandments. We mourn because our sins are many and we realize the mess the world is and that the world needs a savior. We become meek, or rather we give up ourselves. We give up our self-will, don't we? We give ourselves to Jesus Christ. We give up our rebellion against God and uh, we submit ourselves to God and then we can start to live life. Uh, we can start to live life really well as a Christian. So roots, our needs, we need salvation, we need to repent, and we need to submit to God. And once those things are happening within us, whoa, the shoots start to, to bud up. And they can shoot quicker for some, maybe they're a bit hidden, a bit more uh, for others, but the shoots uh, shoot up. And then out of being a Christian and realizing, realizing what God has for us, we start to seek the righteousness of God. We start to want to live a righteous life. Our lives start to change from the inside out. We've got a new heart and we're, we're, we're overwhelmed. And uh, we have a, a hunger to start living right before God, living right in all the circumstances we find ourselves in. Um, and, and that is what happens to a Christian. And uh, people will notice that we are a changed people. I don't know um, if or how long you've been a Christian, but people noticed that I was different when I became a Christian. They noticed something was up. What's up, Chris? And, uh, and it led to some great discussions over the years and over the times of uh, discussing what had happened to me uh, and trying to lead people to have the same experience of knowing Jesus. And so when we put down deep roots and uh, those first three Beatitudes are very much about putting roots down, aren't they, into the ground, uh, getting our sustenance from the Lord Jesus, then shoots start to materialize and then we get the fruit. Well, fruit is what you see at the end of the season. We're in a fruit harvest at the moment, aren't we, for citrus fruits and all the fruits on the trees, some of them have been harvested and, you know, there's a lot more to go uh, and that is visible and then people see our behaviors, that's the fruits of the Beatitudes. And when we produce the fruit of Christ-like behaviors, because we have a new identity, that starts to show in our friendships, in our marriages, in our families, in our church, wherever we live, with our neighbors, and in the world. To be a Christian is a very public thing, is it not? And the fruits, begin with being merciful and another word for mercy would be forgiving to show forgiveness and so the next ones we're moving on into are mercy forgiveness purity and hallelujah peace peace that god gives aren't we all searching for peace peace in body soul and spirit and so we're we're heading in this direction and so tonight we're going to look at the, the first fruit, if you like, the first fruit that is coming out of the Beatitudes, and that is mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And of course, when we think about it, mercy is pretty synonymous with forgiveness. And both words are huge words. We, we can't cover all of the aspects of mercy and forgiveness in a, in a half an hour Bible study, but we can get an overview of it and we can get a, some of the basic building blocks that we need to be building in us and allowing it to show, allowing it to come out uh, when needed. And of course, to show mercy or to show forgiveness is going to be in a difficult circumstance, isn't it? Something difficult has happened. We've been hurt somewhere down the line. There's a situation that, that we find ourselves in and we are challenged to show mercy and to show forgiveness. And when we, uh, when we think about the butterfly, which is up there, when we think about a butterfly, uh, though butterflies are not mentioned in the Bible, okay, they're not mentioned in the Bible, but they're a great symbol, aren't they, of transformation from egg to caterpillar, then uh, the amazing metamorphosis that happens in the chrysalis. 
And so it is like the transformation for a Christian. Um, the seed, which is the word of God, is sown, is sown into good soil, and lots of stuff is happening to the seed in the soil. It penetrates, it permeates, it grows, and then it bursts forth with a great change. In our Christian language, the old man, the old self is gone, being cast off and dealt with, and the new creation, our new self, our new transformed self, our new metamorphosed self, if you like, can, comes out and can be seen. And of course, a butterfly, there's a few around. Helena loves butterflies. And uh, if we're ever around and there's a butterfly, oh, there's a butterfly, and if it rests, Helena will look at the butterfly more or less until it leaves. And that can be for a short time, and I'm rejoicing, or it can be quite a long time. And then I'm tapping my shoe um, whilst Helena's looking at the butterfly. But the butterfly emerges, doesn't it? It emerges gentle, delicate, and beautiful. But if you think about it, a butterfly is also strong and vibrant and it's determined. It's a strong creature. It's in the world out there. Uh, I wouldn't want to be uh, over, overnight in a, in, a, in a camper. I wouldn't want to be overnight, but butterflies are. So they're, they're, they're delicate and beautiful, but they're strong, they're vibrant, determined. And so it is with Christians, when we become a Christian, these things start to come out and show. So what is mercy? What is mercy? Well, a dictionary definition of mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. Okay? So forgiveness or mercy is showing compassion, it's showing something towards another person where it's within your power to punish them or to harm them. You've done this to me. I have every right to sue you in a court of law. You've done this to me. I have every right to do it back to you. You have the power, particularly when it comes to law, if someone steals, you have the power, don't you? I'm not saying that people should not go to courts of law. But, you know, in the, in the normal uh, scheme of being a Christian, we come across stuff and uh, stuff happens and it's within our power whether we're going to forgive them or not. But when we think about these words, there's some great words here. If we think about compassion, well, Psalm 103 verse 8 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. When we think about the word forgiveness, God's forgiveness is shown in Christ. Uh, Acts 2.38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when we take the absolute definition of mercy or forgiveness, the person showing mercy has a position of power to punish or harm. The one receiving mercy is powerless. And I'm gonna give you a number of examples to unpack that a little bit more. The first one is God himself. God himself, he is all powerful. He is in the position to punish and to determine harm. Um, and God will certainly punish and do harm to Satan, the devil, who is an angel of light, all demonic forces. God is not going to show mercy to them. That is already determined, okay? And so God is the one who has power and we know the end, there's going to be a hell and there's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. And that will be separation out of the system for eternity. And so God has that position, doesn't he? He's all powerful and he has that position to punish or to do harm. And uh, the mercy of God, which is what we're talking about tonight, the mercy of God, praise be to God and the new covenant, the mercy of God is reserved for us. The mercy of God is for those who believe. God will show his mercy to his children. God will show mercy to us who once were 
caught in a sin nature, but now we are in Christ's nature. We are sons of God. And so mercy, mercy of God is here now and reserved for us in eternity. You know, when you think about the old covenant, you know, we saw, we can see uh, the power that God had, can't we? When Israel constantly were breaking the covenant, God was raising up armies against them. He was bringing them down and, and, and bad things were happening to them. They were cast out of the land for 70 years of Babylonians and all sorts of things were happening because God's judgment was happening there and then with a rebellious and a stiff-necked people. But even in that, God is showing mercy to his people. He, he, he woos them back. He woos Israel back as a nation. And they go backwards and forwards. They're away and they're back. God is punishing. God is showing mercy. He's calling them back. And God is a God who, who has to do these things within his character. Uh, and thank God we have a new covenant. And thank God we have Jesus Christ. Because in Christ, there is the mercy and forgiveness of God for those who believe. I think it all makes sense. Um, so in the Old Covenant, we can't, we can't bring it, and it brings judgment. Uh, it brings punishment. It brings harm. But again, praise God, a better covenant is here, Jesus said it. The New Covenant brings God's mercy, and it brings his forgiveness, and it brings relationship, and it brings his love to those who believe. There is a Greek word, um, those who are scholars of Greek will pronounce it better than me, uh, but you can read it. I think is how it's pronounced. I'm not, I was never good. You know, I tried doing, uh, learning Greek. I got the alphabet and I got some of it, but uh, they went at such a fast pace. It's hard learning in a language when you're over 30. It's really difficult. You need to get these languages when you're young. And so I thank God that there are tools now where all of the Greek and the Hebrew language of the Bible, through computer programs, you can click on them, you can research them, you can find out so much about it. So, um, you know, thank, thank God for the technology that we uh, live in today. That's one good use of it. So, the Greek word is that. It means mercy, kindness, or goodwill toward the miserable and the afflicted. So, to show mercy, is to show goodwill towards the miserable and the afflicted. And it is joined with the desire to relieve them. <coughs> so in a way, God, when he looked, even before Christ, when he, when he looked at the, the world that we lived in, and he saw the desperate mess that people, the generations were in, God has shown his kindness and his mercy towards the miserable and the afflicted sinner. He had a desire to do something to relieve them. So at a point in time which we celebrate at Christmas, he sent his son Jesus into the world who is the reliever of our miserableness. And Christ is God's mercy to us, to those who would take it on board and who would believe. And I think it is important, that last bit, the, the desire to relieve them is very much at the heart of God. He, 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 certainly for, for us as a Christian, he doesn't want, us, he doesn't want to leave us. You know, we, we, we get saved, it's fantastic. He doesn't want to leave us there. He has so much more that he wants to give to us. So much more he wants to unpack. And along that journey, he shows us mercy and forgiveness all the time, doesn't he? You know, and I, and I think... Um, you know, when we come and we, we, we celebrate with um, um, the, the communion table, there is the mercy of God. We're, we're, we're acting that out every time we kind of, uh, we take uh, mercy. So that last point, mercy is an active word. There is a desire to help to relieve the issues that require mercy. And in humanity's case, it will sin. So the mercy and forgiveness of God is actively shown in providing what? A sin offering, in providing a sin offering to us, Jesus Christ the Lord, by whom we can be relieved. 
and we can receive mercy and forgiveness. And we actually call that being born again. We call that being saved. We call that salvation. And, uh, and then also, uh, the, the mercy of Christ is shown because at his return, he comes to judge the world, doesn't he? Jesus is coming back in his second advent. He's coming to judge the world. Um, and we will receive mercy. There will be mercy for those in him uh, because we know him and we will be blessed. The fruit of, of our lives, the fruit of, of the mercy and the forgiveness of us being in relationship through Jesus, we will have eternal life. Hallelujah. And um, so biblically, mercy and forgiveness, it's not, it's not forgive and forget. Forgiveness isn't about forgiving and forgetting. Forgiveness, to show mercy, to show forgiveness, is an awful lot of stuff to do. Um, it's a massive process. We've not got time to go through uh, all of the intricacies of showing mercy or being merciful or being, being forgiving. Uh, it's going to cost. Mercy and forgiveness is very costly. And um, this active compassion that God had for us when he saw the wretched, helpless state within the legal boundaries of his covenants, he actively did something, sending Jesus. And that cost Jesus his life. So to show mercy and forgiveness is going to be costly. And uh, it will be costly for us also uh, along the, the way. So what mercy is, it's uh, we have... Um, the power, the desire, we want the desire to relieve someone from the situation that they're in. And actually we have a desire to relieve ourselves from the situation that we're in. And so it is better to show mercy and forgiveness because that will release us also from holding on to the results of unforgiveness or the results of not showing mercy, which is going to be all the negatives, anger, frustration, um, hatred, um, psychological problems um, but but we have to work through it it's not simple it's not quick and it's not easy it took a long time for Jesus to come and for mercy to come into the earth and uh, it cost Jesus his life so we have a quick look at, um, at Hebrews just very quickly just to bring a few things out of this. Since the children have flesh and blood, he to Jesus shared in their humanity. So if we're thinking God's mercy and God's forgiveness, God is becoming like one of us in Jesus Christ because we are flesh and blood. And he wants to come down and to deal with and to actively give mercy to us face to face, one on one. Um, and so since the children, since us, have flesh and blood, he too, Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. And he wants to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So he wants to relieve us of all the fears of life. He actively wants to do something to change our situation and our state. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you and me, who you now know, are part of Israel by faith. We are Abraham's seed, more about that on Sunday, but we're Abraham's seed by faith. We are part of the promises that were for Abraham. We are Abraham's descendants by faith. And for this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. So for God to show us mercy and forgiveness, he had to become one of us. He had to understand us. He had to engage with us. He had to do something powerful to actually help us out of the... Uh, quagmire um, and in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God what is a priest what is a high priest the high priest in the picture of the old covenant is the person between God and human 
the high priest was the one who was making, making all the sacrifices, making atonement for the people so that they could be forgiven by God. He was the intermediary. But Jesus Christ is God himself. God cut covenant with himself. He makes peace with himself because Christ is our peace and he died on the cross for us. And so Jesus, God, God in Christ, he paid the price for sin, which we all know about, the sins of the people. And verse 18, because he, Jesus, suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. You know, Jesus knows what it is to be, to be human. He knows. He knows what it is to be tempted. He was tempted in the Garden of Gethsemane. Let this cup pass from me. Oh, he sweat bloods, didn't he? He knows what it is to be human. But he's the one who, with, who is without sin. He never failed. But it doesn't mean he didn't struggle. It doesn't mean he had, had, had the battle. You know, um, it doesn't mean... And, and, and to bring forgiveness, even from Jesus' perspective, boy, that was a tough thing. A terribly, terribly tough thing. And so the cost to show mercy and forgiveness will always be a cost to you and me as well. And the passage we've just read, it clearly states that the devil has the power over humanity, over death. And that is, it was our wretched state, wasn't it? We could do nothing about it. But for God to help Abraham's descendants, and that's you and me, he had to be made as one of us in any way, in every way. And he did that magnificently, perfectly, in total holiness. He is the embodiment of, of all of the Beatitudes apart from the one, the first one, because he never needed to be saved, of course. He is God in human form. So he who had no sin, but who had a covenant agreement with God to become sin for us, showed God's act of compassion, his mercy, and his forgiveness to relieve us from death. And we are so relieved from death when we accept him as Lord and Savior. Um, and actually, we can have that peace. I know where I'm going. You know, we can have that peace. Not every Christian has that peace. We're, on, uh, we're all at different levels of our, of our discipleship and our growth. But it's on offer to us. And actually, in a way, when we really think about it, we should have peace. Whether I live or whether I die, I believe. I have the hope within me that I will see Jesus. I will receive his mercy and his forgiveness for eternity. Amen. Amen. And again, these, these are things you know, but to remember the covenant agreement God had with himself, when God made his promises to Abraham, since there was no one greater than him to swear by, he saw, swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. God's blessing to us is Jesus. And we celebrate that at Christmas. Amen. To unpack mercy just a little bit further, Jesus instructs his disciples, Luke 6, 36, be merciful just as your father is merciful. <clears throat> God is merciful and God's ultimate mercy and forgiveness is in Jesus. God has given us in Christ and he's forgiven us the original sin and we are continuously forgiven, aren't we? When we, when we make mistakes, when we sin now. We have an advocate in heaven and we go to him. He intercedes for us and we're con we are continuously receiving his mercy. And we're continuously receiving his forgiveness. It's a present participle. We're forgiven, but we're always being forgiven. I'm not perfect. I know you're not perfect. So we're constantly in Christ receiving um, mercy and forgiveness. And because of all of this, because God has shown us his mercy, of course, we are to have a compassionate and a merciful spirit. What does it look like? It looks like this. Jesus said in Luke 6, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive, show forgiveness, be merciful, forgive and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. 
And I suspect there, in a human sense, there are different grades of forgiveness, different levels of mercy. We try, we, we, we make a certain amount of progress, but then later on something happens, we might have a memory and it might come back to us and, and sting us. And we have to go through the process of showing mercy and forgiveness uh, again. And so it's an ongoing thing, showing mercy, receiving mercy, showing forgiveness and receiving forgiveness. There are always blessings to be had by God if we can live this way. If we can live the Beatitudes, then we are going to receive the blessings which we've been talking about during this, um, this Bible study ser series. Do I have to forgive? Well, don't, yeah, you know this. I don't know if you had much teaching on forgiveness and things like that. Do you have to forgive? Do I have to forgive? Well, we have to forgive. Can I forgive? I need help to forgive. Who will help me to forgive? Well, God will show me mercy in Christ to help me forgive. And the power of the Holy Spirit can change my heart, my attitude, and help me get through forgiveness. I have to say, there's a, there is amazing things in human nature. Some people who are not Christians, but some people have an incredible capacity to forgive. It's almost like they have a gift of forgiveness without being a Christian. What amazing Christians they would make. <laughs> we need more people like them. Um, and then there are some who find it so hard they can be Christians, and yet they're caught in the trap of being so hurt and not being able to get over or through the hurdles of showing forgiveness. But do I have to forgive? Yes, I do. And I'm just going to read quickly the parable of the unmerciful servant. Uh, it's quite long, but it's, it's incredibly irrelevant. It's a Bible study in itself, but here we go. It's in Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he note his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owned him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him. Same words, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. <clears throat> a poignant ending this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart forgiveness is deep it's serious we have to work at it we have to overcome it we have to give it to god and uh, it's going to cost us now in our story any idea what ten thousand talents is in today's money it's $10 billion or 8.9 billion pounds. And what is 100 denarii? Well, it's about $4,300 or 3,800 pounds. So 100 denarii is still a significant sum in Jesus' day. So that's going to be the cost, isn't it? But 10,000 times, 8.9 billion billion pounds and Jesus of course here he's using what's known as 
hyperbole. Hyperbole is massive exaggeration to make the point. So there's a servant who, who owed the whole universe. And there's no way he's going to be able to pay it back. But he did use a significant sum. It's not like 2p. It's a significant sum in that day to show the point that mercy is going to cost. Showing forgiveness and letting this man off that debt actually would have cost him actually quite a lot of money in his day. So there is a cost to it. Forgiveness and showing mercy isn't an option. And we have to do our level best to do it and to get there. Uh, in 1 Peter 3, 8, um, he says this, Finally, all of you, live in harmony with one another, another aspect of mercy. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. So within the fellowship, because Peter's talking to the church, we need to strive for harmony, strive for unity, strive for sympathy, strive for compassion, mercy and forgiveness. Uh, I don't know whether you find it hard or easy to forgive or hard or easy to show mercy, whether it's easier to forgive a fellow, easier to forgive a fellow Christian than a member of your family or, or a friend or an unbeliever. I don't know what comes easy to you, but we need to do it in all spheres of life. And particularly, time after time, we need to do it within the church. And Jesus, the apostle, he's continually, have you, I don't know if you've noticed, as we're going through these Beatitudes, I hope other scriptures are coming to you, but these eight principles, these eight principles are unpacked time and time and time again. These are summaries of the principle. And in the scriptures, we read lots of different stories where forgiveness is needed, mercy is given, where repentance is needed. We, 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 we are, the Beatitudes are unpacked through the rest of the scriptures time and time and time again. So these are eight foundational points which you will read time and time again. And as you read your Bibles, hopefully you'll go, oh yeah, that, that's part of that beatitude. Yeah, that's how it links together. So Jesus starts the manifesto and then it gets unpacked. And that's called discipleship and learning. But these eight principles are the real bedrock of what it is to be a Christian and to show ourselves as being a Christian. So, so much of the New Testament reflects these eight points from Jesus' Sermon on the, flat, on the Mount. And uh, each one has its own characteristic of a blessing. Here's a great definition or a summary statement concerning mercy and forgiveness. Uh, the foundation for Christian mercy is the fact that we've been forgiven a debt too large to calculate. For those who have received the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ, there's no room for bitterness or an unforgiving spirit. Any wrong from which we've suffered, any wrong from which we've suffered is small compared to the debt Jesus paid for us on the cross. That's the summary of the, the nasty servant. And when we get this, we fully understand it. We are helped to start to become Beatitude number five. Blessed are the mercy, for they will be shown mercy. I hope you've got a bit of an understanding of mercy and forgiveness. Um, and I hope you've got a bit of an understanding and overview. It's not optional. We have to do it. It's going to be hard. We're at different levels. There are, are certainly uh, different depths of, of what's required to forgive depending on what's happened. We do not diminish any of that, um, but we have to engage with it and we have to work through it and we have to do our best to get there. And we cry out to Jesus, help me, because blessed are those who show mercy and forgiveness because they will be shown mercy. And when we start to draw this to, to uh, an end in the next 10 minutes, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The NIV says they will be shown mercy, but the King James, I've discovered, is perhaps a little bit closer to the Greek intention, and it translates the blessing, 
they shall obtain mercy. They shall grab hold of mercy. Not just receiving it, they shall obtain it. They shall grab hold of it. And so when we are merciful, God will show us mercy. But when we are finished in this life, when we have run the race, when we have finished in the faith, we will obtain God's mercy, his forgiveness for eternity. It seems to me as I read my Bible, everything starts here in this life and everything is completed in the next life. It seems to me that we are being saved. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It seems that we are being sanctified. It seems that we are being discipled. We are on a journey in this life on earth. Our real home is the city to come. God's promise to us is this. God has begun a good work in us. He who began a good work in you will carry it on till completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So this is a journey in every aspect. We're all on a journey. It's got its ups, it's got its downs, and it certainly has got its challenges. Be merciful, be forgiving, and when you are, you will obtain mercy. So it seems to me that so many things are now, but not fully yet. Does that make sense? They, they are here, we experience them, but we haven't fully obtained them. So my body is kind of falling apart quite a lot, and I've got operations coming up on my hand and things like that, and all of these things we go through. But even though my body's decaying, I've got a new body coming. So I have so many good things now. God, God is doing great things, but the real thing is yet to come. Amen. And so it seems to me what Scripture is saying, we need to stay in the faith. We need to overcome the world in Jesus Christ. And the now will become the yes and amen for eternity. Do you know, those people who say it's really easy being a Christian, sometimes I've journeyed in my faith. I don't know about you, but you hear about crises of faith. Sometimes things come upon us and we have to work them through and we have to make the decision. I'm staying in the faith. Sadly, there are people who come to a different conclusion and they step outside of the faith. And that opens up all sorts of questions. Were they really saved? Were they or weren't they? You know, what, what, is, this, um, what is this journey? Life is short, but it's very long. Have you noticed that? It seems so long, particularly if you're having to forgive someone for things that they've done 10 years ago and you're still not quite there yet. It's a long time. And yet it's gone in the twinkling of an eye. So it seems to me, we stay in the faith, we overcome, we keep working, we, we keep at it. And uh, the reward is yet to come. Just a little bit about the Ark of the Covenant. In James, it says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What is the law that gives freedom? What is the law that gives freedom? It's the law of Jesus Christ and the taking on of the Beatitudes as our charter, as our character. So the law that gives freedom is the law of Christ and living Christ's way and becoming more like Christ as we grow. Those who have not taken on these spiritual conditions that are laws in themselves in Christ Jesus will face God without his mercy. <laughs> that is a terrible thing. That is a terrible thing. And that's why we go into the world and we tell the people, mercy is here in Christ Jesus. Forgiveness is here in Christ Jesus. Do we believe in a heaven and a hell? Actually, many Christians are not sure anymore. Um, but I think in this church, the majority would say there's a heaven and there is a hell. Heaven is forgiveness and mercy. Hell is where God isn't. We don't want anyone to go there. But here's a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. And in that Ark, 
was held the tablets, the Ten Commandments, the law of God in the Old Covenant. So the Ten Commandments were in the box. And uh, on the lid, you can see the cherubim, the angels, the, the angelic cherubim. And they're bowed down with their wings, creating what is known as the mercy seat. And God was said to sit on the mercy seat in the temple. It's a wonderful visual aid that mercy triumphs over law. And mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy is a higher principle than law. Letting someone off a debt when you could take them to, take them to court, actually coming to a place of saying, I let it go, and releasing them from the debt, and releasing you from the hassle and the worry. It can take time, but actually people do it. So mercy triumphs over law. Yes, you could have had them in a court of law. Yes, you could have done this. Yes, you could have done that. Um, here, our neighbor's taken our sign off the wall. We could, we could denounce him. We could take him to court. We'd probably win in 10 years' time. But actually, we want to be a good neighbor. So as a church, we have decided, and we are, showing mercy to the neighbor. We're not going to do anything. We're not going to hound him. We're not going to take him to court. We're not going to denounce him. We are forgiving him, and we're showing mercy. I'm still praying about the forgiveness side. <laughs> I think the showing of the mercy is not taking him to court, but you know, we, we, we work on some of the other stuff. It's a small example, but we've done it as a church. We've decided to release the situation, to pray blessing over, over him and the business, um, and we are releasing it and we are letting it go. So mercy is higher than law. God's mercy in Christ Jesus triumphs to eternal life. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Let's wind this up and bring it all together in the last three minutes. So the first four Beatitudes uh, are inward, or tend to be inward. Uh, they are the condition of our hearts, our, our attitude to God, to Jesus. Um, and we always, uh, from us, we have to start with a broken spirit. You know this. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We need a savior. And then we move to number two, having a repentant spirit. We grieve of our own sins and we grieve of the sins of the world that put Jesus on the cross. And as we, as we come to know God, as, as our characters are changing, as these things are, are working through us, we have a gentle spirit. We seek to be humble. We seek to have humility before God, to give up our pride, to give up myself, and we, we seek to give ourselves to Jesus Christ. We want the humility of Christ. And then, as we're growing in our discipleship journey, we start to get hungry. As we learn more about the Bible, more about God, more about our salvation, we get hungry and thirsty. We have a, we have a thirsting spirit. We want to seek the King of Righteousness. We want more of Jesus and we want to live like he lives in the world and we pursue that lifestyle and we're going through this inward process of sanctification being set apart for a holy purpose and in fact we get the word saint from sanctification which I know you already know and then we're maturing these are these they happen maybe maybe they do happen in step but they can overlap I mean it's not a fluid diagram but but, you know, we, we go through these stages. We need to go through these stages to come to maturity in Jesus Christ. And when we've got the right understanding, we've got the right bit inside of us, they will inevitably flow out of our lives. What's in us comes out. How we think comes out. You know, the pains and the hurts that we've had, if we're holding on and we've got unforgiving, unforgiving um, um, and unmerciful attitudes, they will come out. And, and, and people can see it. There are times you might see, see it coming out of me even, and, or especially me at certain times. I want to include myself with everybody else. It's not, it's not easy, is it? We are not perfect. And yet, the, the more these things are in us, the more we meditate, the more we, we have the Holy Spirit's help, the more it starts to affect our behaviors and the more we become mature. And so then, we start to get really real. We have a compassionate and a merciful spirit. 
we really start to display the character of God. God is merciful, God is forgiving, and it starts to happen through our behaviors, through our attitude. We have been forgiven our sins. Nothing that happens to us from others can compare to the forgiveness we've received. That's the bedrock that helps us forgive 70 times seven, 70 times seven. What Jesus meant was every time. You forgive every time. You know, because there'll be some there going 70, 70, 70 times seven, oh yeah. That's 449 or something, I can't remember, or is it 4,000 and something? Who's, is there a mathematician here? But as soon as we finished it, well, I don't need to be merciful anymore. Jesus didn't mean that. He meant every time. It's going to cost us. It cost God, his son, Jesus, and it certainly cost Jesus, who knew what it was like to be human. I mean, just think about that. He knew pain in his body physical pain, I mean, my, excruciating, anyway. Oof. And then uh, the turning point, you know, these things start to come out of us. Uh, Blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain the mercy and forgiveness in all fullness. We have it now, yes, we have salvation, but it seems to me that we need to stay in it, and we need to keep working at it, but we will have it completely and fully, full, fully for eternity in heaven that's how the bible seems to read to me i wonder how it reads to you put another way blessed are those who forgive for they will obtain forgiveness blessed are those who forgive they will obtain forgiveness i hope you've learned something out of this i think the last two as i've delivered it it's felt to me to be perhaps a bit harder to understand you might need to read it again from the notes thank you again to Val but this concludes the end of our Bible studies for 2022 thank you very much see you here next week for the carol service and then we'll resume to finish off the Beatitudes um, from the 11th of January that's when our next Bible study will be so thank you very much and God bless you and Marcia will you come and lead our final song thank you bless you Big